So this first sermon is introductory in nature. We're going to kind of scan all the Psalms in a sense. I'm going to give you sort of an overview of what the Psalms are. And then next week, we'll begin looking at some very specific Psalms. And I wanted to ground us in Psalm 23 this morning because this Psalm really does speak to the let me put it in a very academic way, the Christocentricness of the Psalms. Let me tell you what that means. That means that even though this book is in the Old Testament, it's all about Jesus. That even though this book is in the Old Testament and the writers of these Psalms wrote these Psalms long before Jesus showed up on the scene, all of these Psalms in one way, shape, or form ready us for Jesus point us to Jesus, tell us something about Jesus. The Psalms in that sense are very Christocentric, Jesus-centered. And so I want to look at Psalm 23 briefly this morning because that really is sort of the, gives us such a clear picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. But before I get into that, I want to start with some introductory words. We, we talk around here at the sanctuary about the difference between a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. Okay, now if this is your first time here or you've been here before but you have no idea what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm going to explain it so that you don't get lost. But we talk a lot around here about the difference between a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. A theology of glory is called a theology of glory because it's all about our strength, it's all about our faithfulness, our spiritual tenacity, our resiliency, our ability to conquer life's challenges and be an overcomer. It's called a theology of glory because it's all about our glory. It's about us. It's, a, it's an idealistic approach to life that has no room for failure and, and weakness. It doesn't know what to do with sin. It doesn't know what to do with struggles. It doesn't know what to do with insecurities. It doesn't know what to do with fear and disappointment and faithlessness and depression. A theology of glory has no room for humanness in that regard. It brushes lightly over the hard stuff, the bad stuff, and the painful stuff of life. The only answer a theology of glory gives to the question, how are you doing, is fine. Okay, it's fake. It's an unrealistic, idealistic approach to life, which only looks at life through rose-colored glasses and only looks at us and ourselves with, through rose-colored glasses. Um, a theology of the cross, on the other hand, is a realistic approach to life. It's not an unrealistic approach. It's a realistic approach to life. It doesn't shy away from the hard stuff. It calls things what they are. It calls good things good and bad things bad. It calls hard things hard and easy things easy. It, it approaches life realistically. It approaches life as it is, not as we want it to be. A theology of the cross embraces what we call around here a low anthropology, to use a sociological term. In other words, um, it expects fallen people to fall down. It expects broken people to break down. It expects sinners to sin. Sin doesn't surprise a theologian of glory. I mean, a theologian of the cross. Sin doesn't surprise. It doesn't shock. We expect it. We expect broken things to happen in a broken world with other broken people. We expect that stuff. It has room. A theology of the cross has, has room for things like failure and fear and uncertainty and powerlessness. It acknowledges that we are weak and weary and prone to wander. It admits that life is hard and, and that pain is real. That's a theology of the cross. That's what we embrace. That's what we believe around here. It's very human in that regard. Um, this is one reason I'm excited about this series. It's one reason I love the Psalms. It's one reason I love reading through the Psalms. Each Psalm is an honest expression about the way life actually feels. There are um, a lot of different writers. There are 150 Psalms written by a variety of authors. King David wrote at least half of them. Um, but there were a lot of others. Solomon, King Solomon wrote a couple. Moses even wrote one. Lots of them are anonymous. But these are, 
These are songs and prayers directed to God, regardless of who wrote them. These are songs and these are prayers directed to God that give voice to almost every human emotion, which is why I I love them so much. They give voice to almost every human emotion, joy, fear, anger, awe, desperation, jealousy, insecurity, anxiety, sorrow, gratitude, love, longing. You find all of that stuff in the Psalms, all of that stuff. You find desperate writers talking about life the way that it actually is. My mom used to say that um, if antidepressants had been existent in the time that the Psalms were written, we wouldn't have half of them, okay? Um, Because a lot of these were written by people who were desperate, whose only hope was up. They knew their weakness. They knew their frailty. They knew their fears and their insecurities. Um, The Psalms keep us emotionally connected to God through all of life's ups and downs and twists and turns and good times and bad times. In other words, the Psalms give us a song for all seasons. They give us a prayer for all seasons. They give us permission to feel life the way it actually is and to express that, which is why uh, there's probably... I mean, while the entire Bible embodies a theology of the cross, from an emotional standpoint, Psalms really embodies a theology of the cross. It gives us room and space to feel what we're feeling without apologizing for it and to be realistic, to take our masks off and to stop pretending, to not feel like we have to fake it, but to be real with ourselves, with others, and with God. And while there are many different types of psalms, most psalms, like I said, there's 150 of them, but most psalms fit into three categories. And that's what I want to talk about this morning for a couple minutes. They fit into three categories. So if you take all 150 psalms and you begin divvying them up, all of the psalms can fit pretty neatly and nicely into one of three categories. Psalms of praise, psalms of lament, and psalms of thanksgiving. Psalms of praise, psalms of lament, and psalms of thanksgiving. Or what one scholar, Walter Brueggemann, calls psalms of orientation, psalms of disorientation, and psalms of reorientation, which I love. Because you're either, if you look at the course of your life, the life you've lived, the life you are living, and the life you anticipate living, I mean, you're, you're walking either in or through one of those three seasons, either a season of orientation where things are going well, or a season of disorientation where things are not going well, or a season of reorientation where things are getting better again. There's relief. And so psalms of praise, psalms of lament, and psalms of thanksgiving are the equivalent of seasons of orientation, seasons of disorientation, and seasons of reorientation. Praise psalms or psalms of orientation keep us emotionally connected to God when things are going well, when life is well-ordered, and when life is well-oriented. Lament psalms or psalms of disorientation keep us emotionally connected to God when things are not going well when life is disheveled, when life is disoriented. Thanksgiving psalms, or psalms of reorientation, keep us emotionally connected to God when things take a turn for the better, when life becomes well-ordered again, when life is reoriented. Well, the psalms show that there is never a season in life where God is irrelevant, ever. There's never a season in life where God is unnecessary, where God is disconnected from you, or where God is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you're going through, God is there. God is there. He's he's with us. He's with you. He's with me. That regardless of whether things are really going well, or things are not going well, or things are starting to go well again, whatever season you're in, a season of orientation, disorientation, or reorientation, God is there. He's an ever-present help in 
trouble with us, regardless of what we're going through. So I want to introduce these three types of psalms, praise, lament, and thanksgiving, this week, and then spend the next few weeks looking at individual psalms in those categories in more detail. So first, psalms of praise, orientation. I just mentioned that psalms of praise, now mind you, the, the, what they call the Psalter, Psalms, the book of Psalms, what they call the Psalter, was really a book of songs. It was Israel's hymn book. Okay, it was, it was the songs that they would sing. Jesus, there. in fact, the Psalms are referenced more in the New Testament than any other Old Testament book. Jesus himself quotes the Psalms. Psalms are quoted all over the place in the New Testament because people then were very familiar with it. These were the songs they grew up singing. These were the prayers they grew up praying. And so they were very, very familiar with this. So Psalms of praise were sung when everything in life was going well. When life was well-ordered and well-oriented, these were songs and prayers that praise God for who he is, that praise God for what he's done. They are songs and prayers that praise God for his sweetness and his strength, for his power and his love. So, as I read earlier, Psalm 23, this is a perfect psalm of praise. The Lord is my shepherd. He gives me everything I need. I shall not want. There's no need that I have that God, Jehovah Jireh, my great provider, does not give me. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He guides me. He feeds me. He leads me. He is my God. He is my Savior. He is my shepherd. He is my peace giver. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, where I go through the wilderness of this life, through the dips of this life, through the hardships of this life, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because he's with me. He's there with me. Notice it doesn't say that God will protect you from the valley of the shadow of death. It says he's with you in it. As I said a number of weeks ago, God never promised us a smooth voyage. He only promised us a safe arrival. And he reveals himself to us most splendidly in those seasons of life that are hard and heavy and dark. That's when the lightness of God's goodness comes to us in brand new ways. And so he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you're with me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. In other words, I don't need to worry about those who are against me because you're for me. You're with me. You've got me. You are God. Without you, I don't know where I would be. But with you, I am safe and I'm secure. That's a psalm of praise. It's it's acknowledging God for who he is. It's giving praise to the one who can do for him what he cannot do for himself. When life is going well, these songs remind us that it's God who has given us all things. These prayers and these songs give God credit for everything, for every good thing. Now, that's important for a whole host of reasons. But one reason that's really important is because we tend to instinctively grasp for recognition. Okay, I mean, it's like our default mode. We want to be noticed for how good we are, how smart we are, how generous we are, how nice we are, how successful we are, how competent we are, how beautiful we are. We want recognition for this stuff. We we like to be noticed. We've concluded that we will matter if we are regarded. And so we clamor for credit. We do this all the time, all the time. I think I told you the story a while back about a men's retreat that I organized. We had never done anything like that in, or the church that I was serving in its 50 year history had never done anything like that. And I showed up as the new pastor in 2009. And uh, I introduced the idea of men going together, getting together and going away for a couple of nights just to get to know one another, to get to know God, to have fun, to relax, whatever. And it was a massive hit, a massive hit. Now, I had a director of men's ministry at this church who I delegated the responsibility of organizing this thing. Um, 
But I was, I was the brains behind the operation, okay? It was my idea. And so uh, we get to this retreat. We went to Marco Island. We were there for two or three days. I mean, it was a huge success. It was like every guy in the church showed up. There were like hundreds of guys. It was a lot of fun. Everybody had a great time. There was great bonding going on between the men. Um, and the men's ministry guy gets up at the end to give thanks to all of the people, you know, that helped pull this off. And I mean, he thanks to so-and-so for making sure that all the food was taken care of and for so-and-so who made sure and just kind of gone all down the list. And I'm sort of sitting on the front row going, he's saving the best for last, you know? <laughs> now, I'm embarrassing myself by telling you this story because I'm trying to show you that you do this stuff too, as subtle as it may be. We do this stuff, okay? We want, we want the people closest to us to notice certain things, which in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it's the need to be noticed, which can become a bad thing, which can become an enslaving thing. So anyway, this guy goes through his long laundry list of uh, giving people credit for different things and didn't even mention my name. Did not even, not even like, a, and thanks to our pastor whose idea this entire weekend was, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have experienced all the great things we experienced this weekend, okay? I mean, that's what I deserved. That's what I was looking for. And I sat there, very holy-like and pious, <laughs> in my seat, smiling on the outside and on the inside going, as soon as we get back, I'm firing this guy. <laughs> How dare he not give me credit? Now, I'm exaggerating uh, joyfully, of course, to make you laugh, but we do this all the time, all the time. We clamor for, for credit. We want people to notice us. Um, Barry Switzer, uh, who's a football coach, one of my favorite quotes of all time is when he said, some people are born on third base and act like they've hit a triple. I think that's so funny. That's so true. We take credit for things we had nothing to do with, Okay. If you're beautiful, you take credit for your beauty as if you had anything to do with it, okay? Um, if you're, you know, I mean, we take credit for things that we don't really have anything to do with. Needing praise and needing glory is a heavy way to live. You know that. Needing recognition, needing to be noticed is a heavy way to live. And in addition to it being a heavy way to live, it makes us unattractive. Gerhard Ferdy, uh, who's a Lutheran theologian that died a number of years ago, but who I glean a lot from, said, arrogance always attends the slightest success. Stacey and I were talking about that this week. Isn't that true? Arrogance, it's, it's so subtle and it seeps in. Arrogance always attends the slightest success. You experience some success you're, you're, you're successful at something. And as you, it's like you can't even fully enjoy the success without feeling puffed up. Look at what I've done. Look at what I've accomplished. Look what people are saying about me. Psalms of praise in that sense are liberatingly deflective. They're liberatingly deflective because they acknowledge that God is God. They give God recognition. They give God and his grace recognition. They give God the credit for every good thing. In that sense, they're liberating deflective. Praise is deflected back to God. These songs direct our feelings toward God when things are going well and not to someone or something less than God. Psalms of praise serve us in this regard. Not only do they... Not only do they recognize God for who he is and for what he's done and what he continues to do for us, it, it recognizes God as God, but in recognizing God as God, there's also this simultaneous recognition, recognition that we're not God. He deserves all of the praise. He deserves the glory, not me. And when that becomes true, when I realize that to be true, then it frees me from needing credit from needing attention, from needing to be noticed. 
So they keep us connected. Psalms of praise keep us connected to God so that we don't wander off into the land of enslaving pride and unattractive egoism. So psalms of praise serve us in that regard. They are there for us when things are going well, when good things happen, when things are going smoothly. We recognize God as the one who is the provider, the giver. God is the one who is gracious and merciful and powerful. God is the good one here. God is the one who gets the credit. Psalms of lament, on the other hand, were sung when life was not going well. Songs of lament were sung when everything was disoriented, when God seemed distant, when God seemed uncaring, when God seemed like he didn't care. These are songs of desperation. Now, let me make a distinction real quick between complaining and lamenting. Okay, I think, I think we're going to study the book of Job in the fall. I think, I'm not sure I could change my mind, but I think we're gonna study the book of Job in the fall. And in that series, I will make this distinction again, a distinction between complaining and lamenting. And it's a pretty simple distinction. Complaining is really a cry against God. Where are you? What have you done? You're not good. Lamenting is, on the other hand, is a cry for God. God, help me. I'm in a bad way. I'm in a bad place. And you're the only one that can help. Come to me. Help me. Relieve me. Do for me what I can't do for myself. Get me out of the jam that I got myself in. So complaining is a cry against God. And lamenting is a cry for God. Psalm 22, 1 and 2 These are words that Jesus himself spoke from the cross. Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning, why are you so distant? Why do you seem so far away? If I've ever needed you, it's now. Where are you? How long, O Lord, will you remain silent? Verse 2. Oh God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I find no rest. This is a perfect example of a song of lament, a lament psalm. These are songs for when it feels like things couldn't get worse. My health is failing, and there's no positive prognosis on the horizon. My marriage is falling apart. Things haven't been good for a long time, but now they're really coming apart at the seams. Money's running out. Things are so expensive now, and I I can't afford stuff, and everything that I thought was going to secure me in the future is now slipping away. And I'm, I'm stressed about money. I'm stressed about providing. I'm still single. I thought I'd be married by now. I thought I'd be a parent by now. I, I wanted, I've always wanted to have children. Why? Why? I mean, these are songs and prayers for those seasons in life, for those moments in life when you feel like there's just no hope, there's no light at the end of the tunnel. This is, there seems to be nothing but bad news and really bad news. I've told you that story, haven't I? About the guy who went to the doctor to get some tests done uh, and the doctor said, I'll call you in a week with the results. And eight days went by and the guy got a little nervous, like, what's going on? And the doctor called him. He said, Jim, I got bad news for you, and I got really bad news for you. And the guy's like, you got to be kidding me. This is horrible. What do you mean bad news and really bad news? And he said, okay, well, doc, just, you know, give me the, give it to me easy. Give me the bad news first. He goes, the bad news is that you have 24 hours to live. He's like, that's the bad news? That's the bad news. What's the really bad news? He's like, the really bad news is I was supposed to call you yesterday. So doesn't it sometimes feel like... Life is nothing but bad news and really bad news. Well, in those seasons of life, God's given us a song to sing. He's given us a way of expressing ourselves. He's given us a prayer to pray. These are songs that are meant to keep us connected to God in bad times. 
in moments of desperation. These songs and these prayers direct our feelings toward God when we are overwhelmed with life. When life is feeling overwhelmingly heavy and hard, these songs and these prayers direct our feelings toward God. We have a source that we can go to. There is something about the existential struggle of the lament psalms that awakens me to the normality of hard living. That life is hard. Pain is real and we're not being super spiritual and godly by pretending that it's not. These psalms give us the space, give us the room to express frustration and grief and sadness and fear and to direct all those things to God. I find it tremendously comforting to know that I'm not alone in my cry for help as I read and pray through psalms of lament. One of my favorite psalms to read is Psalm 55 where it says, listen to my prayer, O God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear me, answer me. My thoughts trouble me, and I'm distraught at the voice of my enemy, at the stares of the wicked, for they bring down suffering upon me and revile me in their anger. My heart is in anguish within me. The terrors of death assail me. Fear and trembling have beset me. Horror has overwhelmed me. I said, oh, that I had the wings of a dove. I would fly away and be at rest. I would flee far away and stay in the desert. You ever feel like that? I mean, dang, I feel like that. And I could look back at seasons in my life where I, that's all I prayed. Where the hell are you? Where are you? I, I mean, I, I know that I don't deserve all good things, but come on. I mean, where are you? You've disappeared when I've needed you the most. I mean, being able to give, have, give voice to that, God's given us words to say in those seasons. He's given us heartfelt, grieving words to shout in those seasons, in those moments in life. Listen to my prayer, oh God. Do not ignore my plea. Hear and answer me. My thoughts trouble me. I'm I'm distraught at the voice of my enemy. Everything and everyone seems to be against me. My wife's against me. My kids are against me. My boss is against me. My friends are against me. My parents are against me. I'm against me. My friends seem to be talking about me and seemingly scheming. And I I just, I mean, I don't feel safe in this world. I don't feel safe. I don't feel loved. I don't feel cared for. Please help me. I mean, you ever feel like that? There have been many times, many times, when I have cried out to God and begged him to break his silence and to hear my plea begged him. When someone shares their successes with me, it can be inspiring. But when someone shares their failures and fears with me, it reminds me that I'm not alone. And that gives me hope. Lament psalms are there to remind us that life is hard, that pain is real, and we're not alone. We're not alone. And they give us a place, as I said, to go with our grief and our fear. They keep our heart connected to God in times of pain and disorientation. Psalms of thanksgiving, the last category. Thanksgiving psalms were, or psalms of reorientation, were sung when things took a turn for the better, when life reoriented. If lament psalms are songs and prayers of desperation in pain, thanksgiving psalms are songs and prayers of deliverance from pain. You could say that these are songs and prayers of relief. So Psalm 30, verse 11 and 12, good example here. Perfect. These are verses you've probably heard at some point if you've ever been to a funeral. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness. 
that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Man, as deeply as I have felt seasons of lament, I have felt huge seasons of thanksgiving. Huge. When you know the dregs of life, the dark corners of life, the desperation of life, and then God brings relief to you, it's like you won the lottery. I mean, it's, it, to me, it has felt like I, I got a new lease on life. I was driving this morning to church, and it's a beautiful day outside, and I'm listening to a song I love, and I was excited about this new series, and I was excited to be back, and... Um, you know, I was just thinking about life. I was thinking about our little home and the fact that Jenna and Stacy and I live there and it's fun and it's enjoyable and just where God has put us and what God's called me to do. And, and I was just overwhelmed with gratitude. Just overwhelmed. Like, God, seven years ago, I was dead in the water. I had no hope. I thought life was over. I mean, there was no prospect of life ever getting good again, ever. I was convinced that my best days were behind me. There was no way that God could turn this mess that I made into something good. And just fast forward seven years, and I'm going, life is different than it used to be, but man, I'm alive. And I'm surrounded by people that love me and that they're people that I love, and I'm enjoying moments now in ways that I never did before because I took them for granted. And now I just find myself thankful for the smallest things, filled with gratitude for the smallest things, just grateful to God that he brought relief to my life, that he saved me, that he delivered me, that he's renewed my hope. Psalms of thanksgiving express thanks to God for his rescuing help. They rightly acknowledge that God alone saves. He is the great reliever and no one else. Thanksgiving psalms protect us from the pride of assuming that it was our ingenuity and our competence that got us out of the jam we were in. You know, sometimes we experience, I have, I know, experienced seasons of reorientation, and I'm going, see, now, because of my skill and my competence, my wit and my wisdom, I have gotten myself out of the jam that I got myself in, okay? I mean, we do this instinctively. Um, we take credit for this stuff. Uh, we think that it was our skill that sort of put things back on track, well, these psalms direct our thanksgiving toward God and not something or someone less than God. G.K. Chesterton, British journalist from last century, said, I would maintain that thanks is the highest form of thought and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. I love that. Absolutely love that. There is real freedom and wonder in acknowledging that only God is big enough, only God is strong enough, only God is wise enough to bring about the healing and the rescue we so desperately need. There's great freedom in that. There's real wonder in that. Life gets heavy and life gets hard when we begin believing that if things are going to be fixed, if he's going to be fixed, if she's going to be fixed, if the world is going to be fixed, if the situation is going to be fixed, if things are going to get fixed, we are the ones that have to make it happen. We have to fix it. If life is ever going to be reoriented, we have to do the work of reorienting. It's ultimately up to us. Well, you know as well as I do that life gets really heavy and really hard when we begin believing that stuff. It doesn't relieve pressure. It adds pressure to our lives because now if this thing's going to get fixed or that person's going to get fixed, it's up to me and I better do it well and I better do it right or things are going to remain unfixed. That's a lot of pressure to live with. It's a lot of pressure to live under. Well, Thanksgiving psalms relieve us of that pressure. 
because Thanksgiving Psalms keep our hearts connected to God in seasons of reorientation when relief and rescue has come. They point us to the rescuer. And now I'm able, Thanksgiving Psalms give me words to say, words to sing, words to pray. When I come out of a bad time, a bad season, a bad situation, rather than going, oh, it's up, I'm, thank God I'm the one who fixed it, but that also means that I have to be the fixer going forward. It relieves me of that and goes, God alone is big. God alone can fix. God alone can change. God alone can rescue. God alone can save. He alone is God. He gets all the thanks. So psalms of praise, psalms of lament, psalms of thanksgiving. We'll look at individual ones uh, going forward. But let me just conclude with this. The psalms... um, well, let me put it this way. God is, God is concerned with our thinking. You know, thinking, God's given us, he's created us with thinking capacities. And he intends for our, our thinking to be serious and robust. Uh, God is not an anti-intellectual. Okay? He created the minds that we have. And God's also given us the capacity to do, willing capacities, capacities to act. He's given us that. Capacities to think, capacities to act, to do. But he's also given us a capacity to feel, emotional capacities. And in some Christian circles I've been in over the years, they take thinking really, really seriously. And they're super suspicious of feeling, and they don't really care about doing as long as their thoughts are right, doesn't matter what we do. Doctrine and doctrine alone is what matters. And if your doctrine is right, everything's okay. There are some churches like that. I won't name any names, but I pastored a few of them. Okay. Um, then, uh, in part because that's the way I was. And then there are churches that are all about doing. It's about action, doing. It doesn't really matter what we think. It doesn't even really matter what we feel. It's about what we do. It's all about what we do. It's action. It's cultural engagement. It's fixing things. It's doing things. It's going places. It's it's action, action, action. And then there are churches or Christian communities that, I mean, it's like in these communities, thinking is sinful, okay? Uh, And doing doesn't really matter. It's all about the way we feel. It's all about the way we feel. And expressing our emotions uh, liberally, okay? And in some cases, obnoxiously. And all we really care about is how we feel. It's about what we feel. It's what we feel. God's only concerned about how I feel, 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 okay? Well, I'm here to say that God has given us thinking capacities, emotional capacities or feeling capacities and volitional or willing capacities, doing capacities. And while all of the Bible is intended to sort of develop all of those capacities, the Psalms are specific in their intention to develop our emotional capacities for God. They are, they are, uh, they fire our emotions. They help me to feel God. They fire my emotions. They channel our feelings Godward. They give us permission to cry and to yell and to dance and to sing and to be still. They allow us to express ourselves honestly and and realistically. They are a gift to us in that regard. But most of all, the Psalms... The Psalms bring us to Jesus, ultimately. All of the needs and all of the desires and all of the longings that all of the Psalms give voice to find their ultimate fulfillment in Jesus. He is our Savior, our Rescuer, our Deliverer, our King. He is our mighty fortress. He is the object of all of our praise He is the great high priest who has felt our deepest laments. 
He is the source of all that we are thankful for. He is our savior. He is the defeater of death and sin and guilt. He is the one who rescues us from our enemies. He is our righteousness, our rock, our refuge, and our strength. He is, as Psalm 46 says, our ever-present help in trouble. He is the good shepherd of Psalm 23 who looks after us, guides us, feeds us, never leaves us, takes care of us, gives us peace, protects us, and pursues us all the days of our lives. He's the one. He is the friend of sinners. He is the the brother of the outcast. He knows what it feels like to be abandoned. He knows what it feels like to be forsaken. He knows what it feels like to praise, to lament, and to thank God, his Father. He is the friend of sinners. He's he's the God of 70 times 7 forgiveness. And he's the Lord of redemption. He is all over the Psalms, all over. So many of these Psalms that King David wrote were in David didn't know this, but it, we can look back now and go, these, these songs were, and prayers were, were sung and prayed by King David, pointing forward to the one who would ultimately be the king that God set on a throne forever. Not just for a time, but forever. Jesus is all over the Psalms. My hope and my prayer is that as we make our way through this short or maybe long series, um, that we would see Jesus, that our eyes would be fixed on him, the author and finisher of our faith. Let's pray together.